Isaiah chapter number 9, we're going to read two verses, beginning of verse number 6. Very familiar verse, verse number 6. And verse number 7, less familiar because people usually don't read that one along with it, but verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, verse number six, we know if you've studied the Bible for any length of time, that's a prophecy referring to the birth of Jesus Christ. In verse number seven, again, an additional prophecy on one day Christ ordering and sitting down upon the throne of David beginning his millennial reign. Now if you will recall in Jesus' time when he was born of a virgin in a manger Peter and some of the other disciples thought that he was coming to set up his millennial reign then and there. That's why when Jesus said I, I got to go to the cross Peter said not so Lord. I mean, you got to be pretty confident, pretty confident to tell God no to what God just said. Okay? That's how confident Peter was that, no, 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 you're here to set up your millennial reign. That's because between verse number 6 and verse number 7, there's what the Bible would call an epoch or a, a gap in time. We read them back to back, but that doesn't mean that God meant it back to back when he inspired Isaiah to pen it down. Because, I don't know, chapter number 9, could have taken Isaiah a year to write could have taken Isaiah waiting on God five years to write I don't know but Isaiah wrote it down like God gave it to him that's why you can go and read the book of Revelation and you can say well all the things that have happened in you know the church of Laodicea that's happening nowadays doesn't that mean that we're close to the end no the end is whenever God says the end is right well we can look around and we can see that it's close yeah so live today like it's close but also have faith that God's got it all in control and you just do what you can do. But we then, I don't have time to get into prophecy and all those things. But anyway, point that we're, that's not what we're going to be teaching on this morning. Okay. But, verse number six, referring to Jesus' birth. I mean, a, a great verse. I mean, I can't remember if this one was also in the Charlie Brown Christmas play, but there are a lot of Christmas TV shows, Christmas shows from back in the day, not the modern ones. That would make reference to this verse. Why? Because it's a happy verse. For unto us a child is born. What's that? That's a new start. Right? That's life. Unto us a son is given. Well, see, the world, even people in Isaiah's day that heard that. Well, what's so great about a, a son? Well, for people in that day, if you had a son, that meant that there was somebody to carry on the family name. Right? There are people today that even in certain places around the world where there are laws that you're only allowed to have so many children, they desire a son. Why? Because that's somebody that can continue, inherit, take over certain things. Because there are backwards cultures nowadays still that unless you're a man, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do that. Right? Well, why do they desire a son? Because they can pass everything on through an inheritance. They can run the farm. If you want to look at a situation where that wasn't the case, go read the story of Ruth. The land that Ruth and Naomi, by legal right, inherited, it had to be bought from them when they were redeemed. They weren't allowed to work that farm on their own. They weren't allowed to hire people on their own. In other words, if you've got a son in this day and age, you know everything's going to be okay for the future. So there's that literal... Meaning saying, hey, the son that's given unto that child that's born, he's going to be able to take care of everything. But then there's also the prophetic one. That's not the son of man. That's the son of God. That's not Lucifer. That's not Adam. That's God. That's Jesus. All right, well, then he gets into a couple of his names to prove that it's Jesus. And the government will be upon his shoulder and his throne. Or, I'm sorry, his name shall be called Wonderful. Then there's a comma. Counselor. Then there's a comma. The mighty God, another comma, the everlasting Father, one last comma, and the Prince of Peace. All those names, what do they have in common? They're all capitalized. 
Why is that the case? Because those aren't just titles. Those are names. Names that attribute attributes that we can understand to a heavenly God that we cannot comprehend. Isaiah is saying, you, I don't even understand how good he's going to be, but God's saying he's going to be these things. His name shall be called. Keep in mind, this was delivered to a bunch of Hebrews. Hebrews believe that your name should reflect who you are. That's why when you've reached the age 30, if your name, because you can go back and look at, for instance, the lady when God had departed the camp, she named her child Ichabod, because that's what it meant. God left the camp. Right? The name meant something. That's why generally they would name them after people in their family, because they say, we want the heritage of our family to continue. And this, but if the name didn't match up, they'd change it when they reached the age 30. Why do you think God changed Jacob's name from Jacob, which meant supplanter or swindler, and changed it to Israel? Because he said, you're not who you used to be anymore. So names were very important to the Hebrew. So when his name was wonderful, it meant he was wonderful. When his name was counselor, it meant he was the counselor. That's why it's capitalized. When it says that he was the mighty God, that means that he's Jehovah God. Because, keep in mind, the Hebrews, they've only got one God. How many times in the Old Testament do we see that they worship, God said, don't worship them gods that can't see, can't hear, can't speak, can't reach, because they're made out of wood, or they're carved into some type of stone, or they're made out of precious metal. He's saying, no, 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 Jehovah God's the only God that has power. So when it says the mighty God, that means the only God that has power. The everlasting Father means not a new God, the same one that's always been. The one that told Moses out of the bush, I am. The one that told Abraham, I'll make a great nation out of thee. They saying that one. And the Prince of Peace. He's saying this son isn't born to deliver God's wrath upon us. This son is born to bring God's peace to us. And the Prince of Peace means only he can bring it. Not saying a priest, uh, a prince that will bring peace. No, he is the prince of peace. Anywhere he is, it's going to be peaceful. I love this verse. A whole lot that you can break out and break down about that verse. But see, there are some people that don't agree with what we just read. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time to get into it because we'd be here for forever and I'd be ranting about a whole bunch of people that have changed things. We can't do that because I've only got a certain amount of time and y'all don't want to hear that anyway. But, even to this day, there are manuscripts written in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and some of the other languages that the Bible was translated into before it got to English that have survived until this day. Thousands of them. And when this verse is considered, all but three of them agree on what it says. All but three agree that it is wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So you would think that if all but three, three people got it wrong, right? Well, not according to scholars. Okay, there are three codexes. A codex just means it's, it's a giant compilation of the translation that that guy thought was the best. There are three codexes that don't agree with all those Manuscripts that we call the Textus Receptus, the received text. First one's called the Codex Vaticanus. You know where that came from? Catholic Church. But if you can tell me where it came from, you'd be able to answer a great mystery because not even the Catholic Church knows where it came from. They just know that it showed up one day. I'm not kidding you. They just said, we went down into the archives and we found it on the shelf. Well, hooray! Part of the translation of the... Bible is that you can document where it came from, the lineage of it. Those people that translate the 1611, if they couldn't tell you where it came from, they consider it garbage. Because unless you can prove that it's the doctrine that the apostles preached, that you can prove it's the doctrine that Jesus preached, why even bother with it? Okay, but, then there's the second one. 
It's called the Alexandrinus. Where'd that come from? Alexandria, Egypt. And you know what they were? A bunch of heathens that didn't like what Jesus preached, so they changed it so they could preach what they wanted to preach. Then you got this new one. It's called the Septuagint that they found on an island off the shore of Greece in the middle of the 1800s. And that Septuagint, it's the newest one that's been found because the other two, they're saying, oh, those are older than any of the other manuscripts or any of the other codexes. And oldest equals best, even though you can't prove where the first one came from and the second one was written by a whole bunch of heretics. So this third one comes along and they're like, oh, this one might be older than both of those. And it agrees with both of those. There's just a problem. I can take you to court statements and newspaper articles where the guy who actually made, he made it to look old. Anybody got a painting in your house that looks old, but you bought it down at, you know, Menards or where, I don't know where you buy paintings, but you bought it at a store, Hobby Lobby. It looks old, right? The frame doesn't look shiny and new. It kind of looks a little rustic to make it look like it's got, you know, antique value to it, but you didn't pay antique value for it. Right? Well, that's what this guy did to that book. He wanted to give his uncle, who for some odd reason became an Eastern Orthodox monk, he wanted to give him something that he could give to the person that was in charge of their government of that area. It was under the rule of Russia at the time. He wanted to give it to one of the czars or one of the czars second in command. I can't remember. But he wanted to give it to him as a present to say, hey, thanks for funding us and for letting us keep our school open and our orphanage and all this kind of stuff. So he had his nephew who was, at that time, a great bookmaker. He could make, I mean, he hand wrote everything. He was very fluent in Hebrew and Greek and all these other languages. And so he wrote one that was in Greek, but it was only, you know, 10 years old when the guy found it instead of thousands of years old like he claimed. And those three are the only three that don't agree with what we've just read. But here's the thing. There's a bunch of idiots out there who don't want to look at facts or logic and they see something that lines up with what they believe and then now they argue that this verse should be changed and a lot of them have because they think well these are the most prestigious those those other manuscripts and those you know the Texas Receptus th that was just you know found in some common person say these were found in you know acclaimed places where things of knowledge were kept yeah because the Bible was written to the common person where else would you expect to find God's word except among God's people? <laughs> right, but this, you, you may say, Brother Jordan, you're pretty angry. Yeah, I'm pretty angry because of what they changed in this verse. And nowadays, even the NKJV and others are changing things like this in your in, you know, Bible, and they're pushing to change the KJV and get to one Bible. Why? So that there can be a one world religion where everybody can use the same book and nobody has any problems. Okay, well, what have they changed in this verse? Well, they've changed three things just in verse number six. First one they changed, they have changed wonderful, comma, counselor. Anybody know what a comma means? It means a separation. That's why when you list things off, you go one, comma, two, comma, three, comma. Because if you go one, two without a comma, that's 12. And you didn't mean 12, you meant one and two. Right, well, somebody read this and said, no, that doesn't mean wonderful and counselor is two different names. It means a wonder of a counselor. Now, that, that's different. That's not even close. You want to know why? Because wonderful means that Jesus was full of wonder. If somebody says, well, I wonder, it means they can't figure it out. That's why they're talking to you about what they wonder about. Wonderful means that everything that he does, I can't figure out. You know why that is? Because he's God. Everything that we know about God, God told us about God. Because we weren't smart enough to figure it out on our own. Man knows deep down in his soul that there is a God, but we can't figure him out on our own. That's why God had to make a way. Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God knew that we would fail and knew that we wouldn't be able to make our own way. And he had to come and provide it for us. There's a whole lot of reasons why Jesus is wonderful. And there's a whole lot of reasons why he is Counselor, with a capital C. What does Counselor mean? It's someone that advises you on something that you're ignorant of. 
Not stupid, you just don't know about it. Why do you think that most people, when they get into legal trouble, go to a lawyer? Because they know about the law and you don't. Even today in courts, judges will often refer to lawyers as counselor. What do you say for your client? Or what does your client say to this? Why? Because it's not their you know, backside on the burner. But they are there to speak for you. To give you advice. To do what's best for you. So when they say, counselor, what do you do? Well, also before... The court date, you know, they're going to be advising you. There are also people nowadays, you can go, they have marriage counselors. They have a whole bunch of different counselors that you can go talk to people about their problems. But I know the counselor, the one whose advice is always good, the one whose recommendations are always for my best. And here's the thing that's just talking about somebody that gives you advice. When we get into the legal, we do have an advocate with the Father, and that's Christ. You know why Christ had to be the counselor before the throne of God? Only holiness can stand before God and argue our case. I don't want a wonder of a counselor. That means somebody who's the best counselor you've ever seen. You can't figure out how they're so good at counseling. No, 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 no. I want wonderful and counselor. I don't want somebody that's just good at giving advice. Because only God can stand before the throne of God and say, hey, he's under the blood. Amen. Are you going to argue your own case before God? Everything that's not holiness melts away before God. I'll remind you, the Bible says that our God is a consuming fire. Because anything except holiness gets burned away in his presence. Why do you think the bush that he was in was on fire when we spoke to Moses? Because he was in there, but that bush couldn't contain God. Why do you think when he spoke to Moses on top of the mount that there were earthquakes and thunderings and storms at the top of it? Because the very presence of the earth knows that's God. And the earth's been cursed with sin too. It's trying to get away just as much as, you know, anything else would. I don't want a wonder of a counselor. I want the one that can stand there and say, he's, he's one of ours. I want the one that can stand before God and say, when Satan, like he did in Job, goes before God, if he brings up my name and tries to accuse me, the father looks at the son, and the son says, I don't know what he's talking about. It's under the blood. And God says, if it's under the blood, I don't know what you're talking about. It's gone. See, a wonder of a counselor, the best lawyer in the world couldn't get you out of hell. But the counselor can. The one that's called wonderful can. And you say, well, Brother Jordan, that's one thing. That could have been a typo. Okay, I don't agree with you, but let's move to the next one. Then, they combine wonderful and counselor. Then they get to the mighty God. And they change that to, y'all ready for this? Instead of referring to Jesus as the mighty God, they refer to him as a godlike warrior. That's a little bit different. Okay, first off, warriors, again, come to destroy. Warriors come to kill. They come to fight. I find that the last part of it, you cannot be the prince of peace and a warrior at the same time. But then, to keep that word God in there, because... You know, they knew that in this part of... Well, it's mentioned something about God. Well, it must be a godlike warrior. You know what that means? Now they're turning him into Greek mythology, like Achilles. Achilles was somebody that never existed, but yet there were people in Greece that built temples to him and worshipped him because he was so good at fighting, allegedly. And he was so good at fighting that the only place that he had a weakness was his heel. And then one day he got shot with an arrow in it. And I think it might have been poison. And then he died. And then, oh no, our great warrior is gone. That's what these people want you to think about Jesus. I almost had it, but they crucified him one day. He ran pretty well for a while. And he was a godlike warrior. First off, God's not a warrior, God's God. If God says, no warrior can come against him. It's not that God's going to swing a sword at him. 
It's that literally the words of God, you can't fight them. Show me ever where Jesus picks up a weapon. He grabbed a whip. Well, he made a whip once. And he took it. But what's a whip? That's a deterrent. That's not a weapon. I mean, you'd have to try really, really hard or get really, really lucky to kill somebody by cracking a whip. Right? It was meant to drive them out. You don't use a whip to hurt something. You use a whip to get the cattle moving. You use a whip to drive things in a certain direction. Right? And I hate to break this to you as much as I like saying it to you. You can't use a whip to do all the things that Indiana Jones did with a whip. <laughs> okay, but a godlike warrior, Jesus never fought. Show me even in the book of Revelation where he picks up a weapon. It says that a sharp two-edged sword comes out of his mouth. The words of God are what, going to, are, what are going to defeat the enemies of Israel when he comes back. He refers to this as a sharp two-edged sword, but really, this can't kill you. It can save you, but it can't kill you. It's going to hurt when you hear it, but it doesn't cause you actual pain. If somebody preaches to you, you don't die on the spot. Right? If you were to pick up the Word of God, it's not going to harm you. Literally, it may hurt your pride. It's going to cut away at the flesh, but it's to help you. Jesus wasn't a warrior. Jesus was the lamb. Show me where anybody's ever considered a lamb a great fighter. Show me ever where a lamb did damage to somebody. Now, a ram might have, but that's a different story. He came the first time as a babe in a manger to be the Prince of Peace, to be wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, not a godlike warrior. And then the last one, this is the craziest yet. Okay. They changed the everlasting father to the father of prey. I don't get that one. The father of prey. Yeah, I'm not making that up. I don't know how they got that one. I can't even really you know, expound upon what they were trying to... I guess that means that you're the oldest of the, sh of the sheep. I don't know. The father of prey. I don't care how big of a sheep you are. If a wolf comes, you're in trouble. Right? Does it... Is it referring to that? As, you know, he's the shepherd of the prey? I don't know. But my Bible tells me that we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. I'm not prey. Why would I want a God? Why would I want to put faith in somebody that's just in charge of the weakest things? My God's in charge of all creation. I don't understand why or how they got that. But that's what some versions will tell you in this verse. So instead of getting the air, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, you get a wonder of a counselor, a godlike warrior, and the Father of prey. And then they leave the Prince of Peace alone. And here's the thing. You know, first off, what do all three of those things do? They attack the deity of Christ. They attack the one that was prophesied to be born that could take away your sin. To make him more human. But here's the thing. Was he man? Yes, he was all man. But he was also all God. But all three of these are to humanize Christ and make him not the Son of God, but just a really great guy. Somebody that could do things that we couldn't, because a godlike warrior can fight better than you can. That's somebody that fights better than anybody else. A wonder of a counselor is the best counselor in the world. You can't figure out why they're so good at giving advice. I don't, I'm not quite sure what the father of prayer, how that would be the best. But hey, he's the father. He's in charge of it, right? He's the oldest. He's the best among it. And he's still the prince of peace. You don't know why they keep the prince of peace? Because even somebody that's not God can bring you peace in your life. That's what they're trying to teach. You, If he could do it, you could do it. He was just a man and God used Jesus to do things. So you can do it too. And you can be a prince of peace. And it makes me angry. 
But I can't change that. The devil's been attacking the Word of God for a long time. Even before it was penned down, you had people back in the day that were preaching different doctrines. Go read, in, go read the epistles of the Apostle Paul and all the stuff he had to straighten out. He's like, you knew what was right, and you let somebody who didn't teach right come in and teach anyway, and you believed a lie. He said, you've been teaching the wrong thing. You make people too full to child of hell. Why is it so important? Because like I said, great verse. Very popular verse. You know why? Because people take hope from this verse. People take encouragement from this verse. All hope and all encouragement that you get out of this verse is gone if you believe what the so-called educated would want you to hear out of this verse. In fact, I can take you, I'll give you the YouTube link if you want it. I'll have to find it again, but I can give it to you. Where a so-called doctor of theology who taught at a Bible translation school got up on Easter Sunday, preached out of the last chapter of Mark, and left out all the verses that the so-called educated say shouldn't be in the book of Mark. You know what those verses are? The resurrection. He preached Easter and told them how the resurrection really didn't happen because Mark was really the oldest book in the New Testament. And then Matthew, Luke, and John added the resurrection later to match up with the story that they had changed. What does change in the Word do? It robs you of hope. Amen. Which is why I'm going to teach you on this morning. Hope's the most important thing you've got. Hope is the most important thing that we have. If Jesus was just another person, why do you get up in the morning? What's the sense in going out and even trying throughout the day? What's the point in going to the job and getting a paycheck if you don't know that the one that you put your faith in is the Son of God? What's the point in even praying if you, don't, if you think he was just a godlike warrior? What's the point in coming to church to hear what the Father of Pray would tell you? What's the point in going and getting counsel or getting advice from a wonder of a counselor? I mean, Brother Josh has things that are in his wheelhouse. Brother Peter's got things that are in his wheelhouse. Brother Charlie can tell you about being underwater on a super secret boat that he still can't talk about. Right? We all have things that are in our wheelhouse, but not all of us are good at everything. But Christ was. And if Christ is the Son of God, his advice is great on everything. He's wonderful and he's counselor. But if he was just a wonder of a counselor, you can call the law office and say, hey, do you know everything about the law? No, because people specialize in things. Well, what do you do if your God doesn't specialize in what you're getting ready to pray to him about? What do you do when you get into the Bible if your God thought, well, that wasn't important? Or the person that thought that he was a wonder of a counselor said, ah, eh, they don't need to know that part. Why do you think we are encouraged to preach the whole counsel of the word of God? Why is it so important to study the Bible on your own so you know where your hope lies? I can know where my hope is, but unless you know where your hope's at, all you're doing is putting your faith into what somebody taught you. It may have been the truth, but unless you can go back and find where your foundation is, really you don't have any hope. We ought to protect our hope like it's our very life because it is. It's our eternal life. You say, well, they just changed one verse. Yeah. And they've changed other verses over time, little by little, until eventually you get the last chapter of Mark where it does away with the resurrection of Christ. Little by little, they've been arguing that these two, these Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Alexandrinus, and now the Septuagint, all of those are their oldest and they're the best. But they won't let you carbon date them because they know that they're really not as old as they say that they are. They won't let them take examinations of the ink on the pages because here's the thing. They used to make ink out of different things than they make them throughout the years. Dad talked about Bob, Bob Ross on Wednesday night. We'll talk about him again. I remember watching Bob Ross on PBS and he had this color called titanium white. You know why it's called titanium white? It's got the metal titanium in it. You know why titanium white is very you know, cool? because they only found out how to make it in the 1960s. 
So if you've got white on a page and it comes back that it's titanium white when they test it, that eh, can't be older in the 1960s. And then most inks nowadays that are blue are a very variation of what's called cobalt blue. That's because it's got the metal cobalt in it. Well, if they were to test those pages and cobalt blue came back, that puts it sometime, I th think, in the 1800s. Can't be older than that. And the blacks, to make them more rich or to make them last longer, they would change the recipes over the years, and they know those things. But they won't let you test it because they don't want their hope of what they put their faith in to be stolen from them, which is what man's done in those translations. Amen. So be not deceived, God is not mocked. But our hope is a blessed hope. You know what makes it blessed? Christ took the blood and put it on the mercy seat behind the veil in glory. That's why we have an anchor within the veil. That means that it's already settled. Once an anchor's been dropped, it's there. Once you decide we're staying here, the anchor's good. God says that anchor's not moving. That's all that it takes. So you know what that means? It's settled. My hope is firm. It's settled. I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded. But you can't be persuaded that a godlike warrior has what it takes to comfort you when you're brokenhearted. A warrior's brutish. If you want to study about a warrior, go study Esau. He was a warrior. But he also was brutish. Right? He was rash. He made decisions without thinking. Why do you think he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup and lentils? Because he thought about what was best now. He can't give you advice for what... If he was a good warrior and a good hunter, he'd have had a stockpile of food in case he went out one day and didn't find nothing. But he went out hunting, didn't find anything, and he was starving to death by the time he came back. Well, one, if that's his reputation, why would you take hunting advice from him, one? But then two, why would you go for him for any other advice? Look at what Esau made of his life and Edom, the country that came out of him. Always a mess. I don't want a warrior as my counselor. Well, you say, well, that warrior is a wonder of a counselor. I'm sure he could give me great advice for warfare. But I don't want advice on warfare. I want advice on how to live holy before God. I want advice on what God expects out of me and how I can do it. See, because verses like, you know, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Well, how could someone that couldn't even conquer the cross, right? If Jesus was a warrior, he lost the battle. If Jesus was just a fighter, he lost the fight. He got defeated. But see, my... My Jesus laid his life down. Shed his own blood. That means he gave it willingly. He didn't fight him. He laid down as a lamb before the slaughter. Didn't even raise an objection to Pilate. Because if he would have spoken just like he said, I am in the garden, and everybody fell down, Pilate's head would have exploded if Jesus told him who he really was. I mean, Peter just got a glimpse of it on the Mount of Transfiguration, wanted to build a temple to him. Imagine what the governor of the whole region would have done if he really saw who Jesus was. But, why did everything? Because God had a plan. God's plan wasn't to send a warrior. God's plan wasn't to give you a wonder of a counselor. God's plan was to give you the Holy Ghost, who was not only a friend, but a friend that sticks closer than the brother. A friend that even when you don't know what to pray takes the groanings and utterings and says, I will pray for him because I know that they can't pray right now. That's wonderful. That's a counselor. That's a mighty God and the everlasting Father. That's the Prince of Peace. If your peace and your hope is based off of warring to get to an end, ask the Middle East how that's gone for the past... 2,000 years. Always a fight, always a skirmish. Why? Because they want peace, but they try to bring peace through warfare. You want to know how the Prince of Peace brings you peace? When you surrender and repent, He gives you peace. 
There's no fight. There's no struggle. It's, Lord, I know I'm wrong. Save me. Then what are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace. Right there. Then it doesn't just... He goes one above... Because he's wonderful. Doesn't just give you peace. He gives you joy and then love before that. Then the ones after that. Why? Because he's just so wonderful he can't help it. But if all your hope is in fighting in order to get to a place of peace, you'll never have peace. Because when you fight somebody, you either make a new enemy somewhere else or you're going to get whooped and then you don't have peace because now you're either in bondage or you've got to go back and retaliate later. You've got to group some buddies up and say, hey, we've got to go get that guy that got me. Look at, you know, the Middle Ages. Kings overthrown all the time. Why? Because when you overthrow somebody, that makes somebody else angry. And then they start plotting to overthrow you. And it's backstabbing, backstabbing, backstabbing. But see, the Prince of Peace says, you don't have to fight. You just have to come. Admit that you don't know and put faith in Christ because he did it already. That's peace. That's wonderful. Because see, that defies man's logic. If I want something, I've got to earn it. If I want something, I've got to go do it. The Bible says if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. There is a logic to that, but it's because a man reaps what he sows. You can't reap holiness because you can't sow holiness. Because we are sin-cursed. But when you belittle the Son of God that was prophesied to come and did come, when you belittle the one that Islam would tell you was just another prophet, that Joseph Smith... Don't get me started on that joker. The guy was a swindler from the day he was born. And he swindled people into believing in a new religion so that he could go out and marry all of his buddies' wives. But anyway. It's a true story. I could show you that one too. But anyway. When you belittle the one that was wonderful and just make him common, then you're not putting faith in Christ anymore. You're putting faith in what other people tell you will give you peace. You're putting faith in what you can do to bring you peace. Because even in Islam, I mean, we've, we've taught on it before. Brother Randy, thankfully, didn't put that one up on YouTube because I'd be on a hit list somewhere in the Middle East. But in Islam, they teach you, if you kill a bunch of infidels or non-believers, you've got a place secured for you in paradise. That's based off of what you can do. Catholicism, it's about works. It's about how many times you pray, how many times you confess. They don't like to admit it, but, I don't know, about 200 years ago, they were still selling you know, pieces of paper that said, if you give us enough money, we'll forgive your sins. You give us enough money, we'll forgive the sins of people that have already died. Amen. Before that, if you kill non-believers, you've done a work for God. You ever heard of the Spanish Inquisition? And believe it or not, you know who they were killing? Not Spanish people, people that believed the Word of God. Didn't agree with infant baptism. Because they said, no, that's not the way that God taught it. And that God gave it. And they said, all right, kill yourself. Or we're going to kill you. And they said, fine, kill us. What are you going to do, threaten me with heaven? And you say, well, what's all that? That's based off of what you can do. Not too long ago, the church, Catholic church, taught that you could obtain salvation by punishing yourself. Whipping your own back until people would literally pass out from blood loss. I'm not talking about, you know, punishing yourself through works. I'm talking about literally inflicting harm upon yourself. That's devil worship. I can take you and show you where the prophets of Baal did the same thing over in Elijah. In Elijah's day. But what is it? That's something you can do, and they control the power if they can tell you what to do. Different religions around the world, it's about, you know, we can go to the East, and there are religions that teach that you have to find harmony or zen, or you have to reach another plane of thinking. That if you do good deeds this time around, you'll get bumped up the tier the next time around, and eventually you can become a cow and be holy.
Right? Those that say, if you can become one with the universe, well, I can become one with the one that made the universe. I am his and he is mine. I'm a joint heir to his throne. I'd rather have him than the universe because he made the universe and he's more wonderful than the thing that he's created. We can look around and see the works of his hand and know that nothing was made by anything else that was made. Nothing around that I can see made any of this other stuff. It's too wonderfully made. Because we are fearfully and wonderfully made by one that is wonderful. See, it gets under my skin when they start changing things. Because they start attacking the one that I love. The one who did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And it all attacks our hope. Because if your hope's in what you've done, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. If your hope's in somebody that you're talking to behind this little veil who's wearing a dress and says that he can do something for you, I'm not putting a lot of confidence in that. But there are people that have been brainwashed into believing that that's what they need to do. But when a storm comes your way, where do you have to go? You got to go back to a man. What if he's asleep? What if he doesn't have the time? My God always has the time. My God's always there. And we've said, even when I don't know what to pray, He does it for me. When I'm not strong enough, He's the mighty God. When my life's upside down, He's the Prince of Peace. When everything that I look out and see in the world is awful and nasty, He's wonderful. You see why I like the fact that they got it right? And you see why it irks me that some people don't agree with it? I know why they don't agree. They haven't been introduced to the one that's wonderful. Because then they'd understand that he's wonderful. That he's, he's the counselor. Why do you think that his name, later was prophesied, would be called God with us? Emmanuel. And it was. Jesus. Go study out what the name Jesus means. God with us. God dwelt among man so that man could be given what man always desired but couldn't give themselves. God came and offered to man something that Lucifer wanted and Lucifer got kicked out of heaven for. To be a joint heir to the throne of God. To be a son of God. To be a child of God. Not of man. Not of a religion. Not of works. But the one who, John chapter number 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God. Why? Because without Him was nothing made. By Him and through Him do all things consist. That's who my faith's in. That's where my hope lies. When I don't know what to do, that's what I cling to for strength. When I don't know which way is up, I know that He's got everything in control because He is who this verse says He is. But those that don't have it, I don't know how they make it. I don't know what they're clinging to. And when you start thinking of it that way, it's real easy to understand why people cling to some of the things that they cling on to. Because it may be perverse, or it may be doing them harm, but to them, it makes sense. And they just want something they can understand and that they can put hope in. So protect your hope, or else we can end up like them. It's only by the grace of God we're not in the worst situation. It's only by the grace of God that that wasn't us 5, 10, 20 years ago. It's only by the grace of God that we have received the truth. So cling to your hope and go share it with others. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.